Mr. Joule was one of the first physicists to come up with systematically, carefully, and quantitatively with very clever experiments. And it is partly for this reason that we have named the unit of energy after him. Many physicists work on this idea, though. It took a lot of years, and how are you going to show the caloric theory is wrong? Well, let's think about some very simplistic arguments against it. Against it. Number one argument. If caloric is a physical substance and you are pouring it from one thing to other when you are transferring thermal energy, then as your coffee cools down, it should become lighter because it has less caloric in it. You could make some careful measurements, weight the coffee before and after it, it has cooled off and you discover that there is no measurable change in, it, in its mass. Wow, but how do you measure it? Such a tiny, tiny differences. <clears throat> now you have to start standing on your head, you say, well, Maybe the caloric is really, really light, and so we cannot measure it. It's just not a massive substance, alright? Supposing that I take a block and it's cool, and I take a drill bit, which is also cool, and I start drilling into the solid object. It's very, very, very rigid solid material, so the drill bit is just gliding, and gliding, and gliding, and barely doing anything. You know what happens? It becomes very, very hot, very rapidly. If you believe in the caloric, where is the caloric coming from? You're creating it out of nowhere. You had two cool objects and doing physical, mechanical work, force times distance. Friction's force scraping across the object at the drill bit is creating a caloric out of nowhere. If you are a classical physicist, you find a difficult idea to create a physical substance out of nothing doesn't seem as if it, is, if, if it, it fits in the Newtonian ideas. Ultimately, there were many, many experiments and this idea of jewel that we are talking about not about material substance, about energy, really becomes so well verified that it formed the law of thermodynamics. Wow, tell me, tell me. Let's talk about them. The zeroth law of thermodynamics is an a sense, a, a sense defining what thermal equilibrium means. If you have two objects, A and B, and you touch them together, they, they might be in the thermal equilibrium or they might not be. Mm. If they are not, one of them will change. It will cool off and the, the other will change. It will warm up until nothing happens anymore. When nothing more happens, they are in the thermal equilibrium. The zeroth law of the thermal dynamics says, if A is in equilibrium with B, and then you separate them and you check and you discover that B is in equilibrium with C. Alright, so we've done a pair of experiments. Then the zeroth law of thermodynamics argues or, or conclude that A and C will be in equilibrium with one another, graduate, uh, guaranteed, guaranteed. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. <laughs> this is uh, this is something like that. Aristotle is uh, the human being. All human being, but die. So Aristotle or Archimedes uh, die too. Something like that. Uh, so let me repeat it again. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So this is simultaneous equation, right? Now you might think that's obvious, but it's not equal as a mathematical function. It's equals meaning it, it, it equals meaning in physical equilibrium. It's a statement about the world. And it's a very practical statement. It means that if you take a thermometer and go to the factory and calibrate it, you hold it against an object that somebody has defined to be 98.6 degrees. You wait until they are in equilibrium and then you draw a little line where the fluid is. Now you've separated A and B. 
You move the thermometer and put it in your mouth. You wait until the thermometer comes into the thermal equilibrium with your tongue and you look at the state of the thermometer and say, Oh, it's in exactly the same state as it was before. So the temperature of my mouth is the same as the temperature of this artificially defined definition of what 98.6 is going to mean, right? This allows us to use thermometers reliably and understand what they are measuring something physical and re repeatable. Temperature becomes meaningful with Zero's law of thermodynamics and it tells you, it tells us how you go out measure, measuring it. You compare things. You, your mouth is the same temperature as 98.6 standard and so we say your mouth is at 98.6. It's meaningful. That's what the zero's law of thermodynamics is telling us. And notice that there are some very subtle ideas in, in there. The thermometer can be big or it can be small. I don't care. I, it will be in, in equilibrium with my mouse and with my uh, with a 98.6 thunder, to, no matter what it's made of. What materials you make, make it of? High tech, low tech, big or small? The zero's law of thermodynamics says the temperature is well defined. It's a property of objects. Yes. Now, if you think about atoms, you're thinking about statistical mechanics, which I kind of think of there as an underpinning of the law of thermodynamics. What I realize is that, of course, temperature makes sense. Temperature is measuring the average kinetic energy. So average kinetic energy. So uh, one half uh, mass times uh, square of velocity. Velocity square. So uh, the the temperature is measuring the average kinetic energy of the little atoms in the system. In my body, there is an average kinetic um, energy, and um, then the thermometer goes into the equilibrium. What does it what? What does that mean? Well, if the thermometer starts off colder, that means that the atoms in the thermometer are jiggling more slowly. What happens when you bring two solid bodies into the contact and microscopically one of them has atoms that are jiggling slowly and the other has atoms that are jiggling rapidly? Well, the, li the rapid one will walk wa more frequently into the slow ones and speed them up. Of course, there's, they will slow down in the, pro, in, the process, in the process, so the first one becomes slower and the slow one becomes faster, right? This, this continues until everybody is going to at basically the same average speed, and that's an equi equilibrium. Now we have a microscopic picture that helps us to make sense of the, the zero law of thermodynamics. In the end, when you have an equilibrium, all of the atoms will have the same average energy. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that the, every atom is going to exactly the same speed. Some are going faster, some are going to slower. They keep bump, bumping in one another all of the time. Uh, but uh, when they reach the city site, uh, then you have uh, this lovely summer equilibrium and you have a uh, well-defined temperature. Temperature has nothing to do with the material object. It comes down to the average energy of the whatever particles you happen to be made of. Gaseous, liquid, solids, and everything is made of atoms, so everything has this nicely defined temperature. Haha. <laughs> the first law of thermodynamics takes this and now add in the story of energy flow. It's really a statement of energy conservation, but in, a, in the new way. There are some words that we need to keep straight and uh, these are subtle words. We can easily mark them up because it's this usual story that physics where the words are defined by physicists, but they also have a common English usage. I've already used some of them uh, incorrectly because in, the, in, the, in the some cases we tend to sloppy about the thermodynamics words. words. The, the, the three words are Temperature, thermal energy, and heat. Right. 
we've already talked about temperature. That's uh, what the zero's law of the thermodynamics is helping us to make sense of it. And temperature is one thing. It's an average kinetic energy in a microscopic, in microscopic model. The thermal energy is not the average, it's a total. The thermal energy is not the average, it's a, the total. Wow. If you have a block and it has some total amount of energy, because every, every atom and molecule has its own little energy, we need kinetic energy. A little, ten, little teen, teeny weeny mass. And if you add up all of the all of those, that gives you uh, the total thermal energy of the object. When you slide the book across the table, the original kinetic energy, however much of that there might be, is spreading out over many countless billion of billions of atoms. Wow. <clears throat> Because it is spreading out over so many atoms, each individual atom doesn't change all, the, all that much. A tiny increase added up over many million and billion of objects can add up to the reasonably large amount of energy. That's why the book slides across the table. Its kinetic energy seems to have disappeared and the, the temperature barely rose because the, because the average didn't change very much. The, the grand total the grand total increased by in exactly the amount that we started with. Wow. Okay. What about heat? The last of the, those three words. Heat is the trickiest of them uh, trickiest of them all. If you want to use the word heat correctly, as a physicist does, that is to say if you want to use the word as it is uh, defined, think of a uh, think of it as a verb, think of it as a verb, I heat the water. That's a good usage. That's a good usage. You shouldn't talk about how much heat is there in the water. That's a noun, and it's treating heat as if it is a material substance. You are going back to the whole, you are going back to the old caloric idea that there is something there in the water. It's awfully easy to say, and I say it myself. I will not fuss on this too much, but when you have a, a hot object and you have a cool object, you, we say that the cool object becomes heated. When, what do we, what do we mean by that? We mean there is a flow of thermal energy. Heat really is defined as a flow of energy. Thermal energy from one object to another object. When you talk about heating up the water, you are talking about the flow of thermal energy. The total thermal energy of the water increase when you heat it. Wow. The first law of the first law of thermodynamics puts this together in a simple statement that say, if you have an object, you can do things to it in a, in a variety of ways, but energy must be conserved. The first law of thermodynamics say, energy is conserved. Let's be very clear about this. If you have an object and it has some total thermal energy and uh, you do something so that thermal energy ch changes, how much will it change? It is just a con conservation of the energy. The, en the thermal energy increase of the object will equal how much physical work you did. That's a transfer of energy, force times the distance. That's a mechanical, right? That's one way of adding energy, plus the other way of adding energy, which is heating, which is heating. So that's one way of adding energy, plus the other way of the adding energy, which is heating. The total change in the thermal energy arises from work done, plus heat. Work and heat are two different ways of thinking about the transfer of energy. Okay? So that's one way of adding energy plus, plus the other way of adding energy, which is heating. Total change in the thermal energy arises from the work done, work done plus heat. Work and heat are two different ways of thinking about the transfer of energy. That's the first law of thermodynamics. Wow! Why I am so high? <laughs> Stay calm, please. <laughs>
it said that if you put a cold object on the stove and the stove is hot, I could turn off, off the switch, but the stove is still hot, like law of inertia. Yeah, this is exactly law of inertia because the, the molecules are still jiggling. Because because the, the, they have uh, the kinetic energy, energy, and the kinetic energy is convertible to the force. Force has an inertia. Uh, the force has an acceleration, so law of inertia. The water is going to become hotter and hotter over time. Why? I am putting energy into it. If you are hotter, the, that means your temperature is going up. If your temperature is going up, that means the average energy of molecule is going up. You still have some same amount of water, so if the average of each one goes up, then the total must be going up. We must be adding energy. Where is it coming from? How do you add, add energy? The old post-Newtonian way was to do work force times distance. You could run the paddle wheel through it and make friction and do some physical, mechanical work. That would be one way, one way of heating the water, but that's not what is happening on the stove. Instead, we are just doing the heating. We are transferring the random motion of molecules on the stove, stove top and converting that into the random motion of molecules in the pot of water. <laughs> James Jules, James Jules is arguing that the thermal energy can be measured. It's just all one and the same thing. It's just energy, and so heat and mechanical work are really equivalent to one, uh, one another. He measures the mechanical equivalence of heat. If you do a certain amount of work, certain force times distance, you can see the, how much the object heats up. You can see the change in temperature, and then you can compare with it, uh, compare that with the amount of heat flowing from some temperature differences. Now we can talk about flowing heat with the exact same measurable unit, joule, joules. We can talk about flow of heat in joules in, in these two different ways, work and heat. Wow. In the end, the first law of thermodynamics is telling us that there is a bottom line here. We can understand temperature by thinking about equilibrium. We can think about if we want uh, internal energies, we can go down to the level of the atoms and what we discover is that in, in certain sense there is nothing new there. Nothing, uh, there is no new mysterious caloric. We don't need to hypothesize this mysterious new material substance because you can understand what's going on just by thinking about energy measured in joules in, a, in these different forms. Thermodynamics is a bookkeeping. At this point, uh, we are just keeping track. How many joules did I have to start with? And in what different way did I did, did we transfer the energy? It's very nice. Physicists love to have a simple book, bookkeeping tools and uh, energy is one of those great useful tools. It's just a number that you add and subtract. <laughs> Arithmetic. So um, there is more to there is more to the thermodynamics than the just bookkeeping. And in the next lecture, we will talk about the new concept, entropy concept, that we will shift our story a little bit and teach us to think about why things happen in a slightly different way. For example, recognize that the, that just the first law and zero law of thermodynamics allow us to understand. An awful lot of practical things, measuring temperatures, measuring the property of objects as you put them on the stove. What happens when you steer them? What happens when you squeeze them? And all of these are really one in the same fundamental ID.